Yeah, all right, it's getting all hot and sweaty up in this club. You better come down to the dance floor. You're gonna groove, you're gonna move, and we're gonna get it going. <laughs> Ashkan here, over here. How's it Graham. going? Graham over there. Graham here. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome to our little podcast. You on the other end of the headphones. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have a we have a question today to answer. Yeah. So we so might kind as well of a just new get format down. for us. <laughs> just know? exploring it, you know, yeah, seeing today, how this works out. Today, what we're going to do is answer a question that was sent in to us. It is, what can I do as a center owner to help make sure that float research happens? Hmm. Yeah. This is an, this is an interesting question. Are you? I, do you have a lot of money? Yeah. Are you a big pharmaceutical? Are you company? a donor? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, you you could actually just donate a lot of money to float research. That would definitely help. Yeah. So, so yeah, floattanksolutions dot com slash podcast. <laughs> we're out. This this is an interesting one because I think it's uh. A very common inclination for everybody to have. Like, uh, it's hard for almost anyone to open a float center without wanting to contribute to float research. And I think a lot of people are into the idea and, and want to use their float tanks for it and, uh, you know, want to even run their own studies or kind of a whole range of different things. Yeah, there's like an obvious one too, which is that people get started and then look up all the research about floating and find out there's not a ton. And they're like, how can I help? You know, how can we get this out faster? And you just see so many experiences that people have coming in and you yeah. you know want to want to have like something more uh empirical to point people to when when you want to explain to them like what's happening to people in there and you don't want to just sound like you're telling all these individual stories yeah so it makes sense and i do then there's some like precautions i think when it comes to this uh idea of doing your own research or, or trying to support research in some way that are worth knowing yeah, and, and Justin Feinstein uh, has been especially vocal recently about this, but, uh, you know, that you, you can't just run research. <laughs> uh, there's, there's uh, you know, people got in, in trouble back in the, uh, you know, well, really like the early 1900s up through maybe the, the 80s or so uh, consistently for running, in, especially in psychology, these kind of... Uh, what, what, what would you call them? Um, uh, un- unethical. There, there we go. That's where I was going to say evil, but uh, unethical studies, right? You're, you're subjecting people to things that maybe they shouldn't be subjected to. And at some point it was decided, hey, we should review this project a little more thoroughly. And running you know, serious studies that haven't been approved, you're kind of a rogue scientist, which isn't looked on very friendly by our national legal system. Yeah, so now there's all these, like, you know, very... Uh, regimented protocols and and organizations in place to make sure that if people are doing research, they're doing it in a way that is not going to be kind of permanently traumatizing to the people involved or, or uh, you know, this is somehow harmful to the people who are participating in your research, that, that research is being conducted safely. So, you know, the, the first step is to make sure that you're doing things correctly, which means, uh, you know, I, this, I guess let's back up a little bit too. This is like if you're doing research, which is not even the perhaps number one way that you yourself can contribute to a lot of the research out there. But by default going into it, if what you want to do is like team up with the university, run your own research, or just start asking people questions out of your own center, just know that there's some some certain protocol that you need to take if you're doing that. Yeah, and if you don't follow it, very likely your data will be unpublishable or, you know, to the point where if something does go wrong, you may actively be kind of harming the world of, of float research. Because people, you know, the general science community looks at that stuff and thinks of it as kind of rogue scientists and uh, and doesn't look kindly on it. So, so if that's the direction you're going, just just do your homework and know what you're doing and realize it's a little bit more complicated than it seems. Yeah, if you want to hear more about that, definitely write in. Again, Justin Feinstein has been um, talking at that more. There's a great episode of Art of the Float, I think, where he goes into some more detail about it. Yeah, and he came on our our. Uh, oh, yeah, and we had him here <laughs> on our podcast. <laughs> there's a there's an episode of the Float Conference podcast where he talks about we kind of go over this in, in detail and, and you know a little bit more about what's required and and what uh, things you you have to do that I think people don't exactly think of at first to do kind of legit research. 
And and his goal ultimately is to start studies that can be run at multiple float tank centers and kind of just collect these broad data sources. So keep an eye on a he he made a site called Clinical Flotation. And I think he plans on on updating that project there. Um, it's also just a great resource too, as a as a side note, for going and getting actual PDF copies of full studies that have been um, kind of most of the peer reviewed studies out there for flotation. Uh, he has not just the references, but the full studies. So great place to send other scientists as you are starting to talk to them, or if you're into reading nitty gritty research, just to cruise on over and and get access to those. It's a uh, it's a yeah, very very truly an awesome resource to check out. So, other than literally doing right. your own research, yeah. how, <laughs> how else can you contribute? Out of the weeds, out of the weeds. To the world of float research. Uh, I mean, the, like, if you do have extra money, you could literally donate money to something like I wasn't kidding. It's, the float I mean, clinic it's out, and research center. You started library. a float tank center, so you probably don't just have a bundle of, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, $100,000 sitting on the side. But. So, I don't, I don't think that's most people's uh, exact situation. I mean, most people... The logic is that you have access to float tanks, which is a much rarer thing than necessarily like having yeah. money in, and that's what they you want to like utilize to to kind of help to the float research world. And um, you can, I mean, I don't think people are doing this as frequently now, but in my mind, what what could help the research world is more people doing float research. And as float centers, I think we can help try to spread the word and, and plant that idea in people's heads. And especially, I think oftentimes research is coming out of universities. Yeah, you know? for sure. Students need projects, grad students need theses to write. Like that's that's where so much, when you look at the old flow research, so much of it is associated with, with various universities. And especially, yeah, medical universities are a uh-huh. great resource if you do have one around you. And so, you know, that's that's a thing that I think a lot of float centers have access to. There's probably some big university not too far away from you. And that's, I would think, a great place to, to reach out to and see if there's some connection to be made. And that can range anywhere from just trying to connect with, you know, professors in maybe the psychology department and and give them some free floats and, and just see if it's something that sticks or, or ends up as an idea that's in their mind so that... If they're working on something with a student, maybe that'll be an idea that comes up. Hey, you should do like a float research project for your for your thesis or, you know, whatever. And and to me, that's just kind of one of the more like grassroots way that something like this can spread. Actually, that that's like my my preferred answer to this question, actually. Like very seriously, just get scientists floating. You know, sometimes it's beyond scope to go and prepare a research study and and to work with a specific researcher. And, you know, even if you get halfway through designing a study, don't be surprised if all of a sudden that person gets really busy with their other research (laughs) and has to drop off. Or if you get really busy with the tank that goes down and now you're spending all your time on this, you know. So just introducing people who could eventually be influencers or start spreading the word, like kind of getting the buzz about floating going in the scientific community, no joke, I think is actually a very powerful way you could help float research. Because those people do have things figured out, like IRB approval for their research studies and stuff like that. And as things progress, then you can help even more by giving free floats to a, you know, a sub-program that they're trying to do where they're trying to pull data and, and allow the access to your float tanks to be a bigger way of contributing to, to some sort of float data like that. Because that's a big hurdle for them. You know, if they want to do float research, the idea of them setting up a, a float tank or multiple float tanks <laughs> yeah. in their own research lab is is a huge leap from just wanting to do float research. Yeah, yeah. So in that sense, you can really be an asset to yeah them as scientists in addition to the science of floating, which is kind of neat. Yeah, and and just that awareness in general. You know, we we've done things ranging from right now. There's a student at, at Reed College here who's working on like a float research program with having people float in our in our place. And and have uh, just ranged down to, to reaching out to professors like Graham and I at some point reached out to different professors at Portland State University just to see if we could give guest lectures at certain classes that seemed related to floating and ended up, you know, going and speaking in a stress management class. And that professor really liked floating and then started spreading it with her other students at uh, a big medical university here, the Oregon Health and Science University. And then at some point, like the university even just like funded half off floats for all of the students of her class to come float two times over the yeah, course of their class. Yeah, super cool. And you know, like that didn't, it didn't lead to like data that got published, but it did lead to an entire group of med students coming and floating as part of their like class curriculum and going on, you know, who knows, those people may eventually end up in a position where they're doing research related work and, and now they have float experience under their belt and it's going to be something that's more top of mind for them. Yeah. And all these little things add up, you know, I mean, yeah, maybe you don't have $100,000 to contribute or enough time to work with a researcher to get an IRB approved study going at your local university. But 
yeah, spreading around some free floats in the right crowds can, you know, maybe just as a, as a catalyst really get that going. So, yeah, don't, uh, you know, and I also don't, like, with things like this, I think it's important because we're really into the wishy-washy nature of of the the universe and the environment. <laughs> you know, like, often plans fall apart, often things you never planned for come to fruition. And so it really is kind of creating these these fertile fields where the, the things that you want to happen are just a little more likely to to come to fruition. So even if you never see any results of your efforts and, and you don't see any local research coming out, who knows? You know, maybe some of the stuff coming out nationally or internationally in float research was spawned by just some student who came in and floated at your center. Yeah. We believe in you. We you're, believe. You're helping more than you may think. <laughs> um, yeah, any other any other ideas or should we end it on that positive? Uh, I guess the other thing I'll say is it's it's really easy in the world of floating to be making a lot of claims that may or may not actually be backed by good <laughs> float research. So another way of contributing to this world of, you know, of, of empirical float information is just to like take some time and, and, and learn about what you can say and what you can't say and, and just be part of the force that's spreading information that, you know, is more backed by, by kind of the data that we, that we currently do have. Like we do have some data and, and understand what it is and, and be able to say that stuff confidently and, and make sure you're not spreading information that's not backed by uh, <laughs> empirical data because that's, you know, that's another reason why things may be more difficult to get funding or, or to have credibility in the future is because people out there are making claims that aren't necessarily supported or supported yet, you know, until, until data is actually done on them. Yeah. Data is sort of like guilty until proven innocent. It goes the right. opposite of our criminal system. So yeah, <laughs> saying, uh, yeah, saying things that haven't been proven yet isn't, isn't looked on too fondly for sure. Um, and we have a we have a great episode too of of daily solutions where we go over different actual claims that we sh- you should probably feel comfortable making and other ones that are pretty common to make that maybe you shouldn't feel as comfortable making. So uh-huh. it's a good one to go review. Peter Sudfeld has one we reference it in that episode, but also just a great great float conference talk on what he thinks is is the the stuff that you can say and what you can't say. So yeah. also a really good refresher. Yeah. Um. Oh, and. Uh, have your staff watch that stuff too. Yes. You know, when, when new staff get hired on, train them in the scientific things that they should be saying versus not. Like, I think that's one of the easiest ways for misinformation to spread is even if the owner's well-educated. It's so, you know, we have turnover, people come in and out, and, and if the person who happens to be working your front desk that day starts saying outrageous things, that's just what your customer comes away believing. Yeah, we also have a, a download called the About Float Tanks Guide on our Float Tank Solutions site, which has, you know, a kind of listing of the benefits of floating in there. And we've actually like vetted that with the different researchers and made sure we're not saying stuff in there that is outlandish or (laughs) just kind of, you know, things we made up in our brain or whatever. So another, another good place to look. All right. And if you have questions of your own, you can go over to floattanksolutions.com slash podcast. And we'll read whatever you send us. Out loud. No filter. Right here for the public. Yeah. Like we just one word at a time is all we're taking in. So it could, it could be anything. All right. Bye everyone. Bye.